Um, the first guest that I'd like to introduce to the stage, and I can't quite see him at the moment, I'm hoping he's here, is uh, Ambassador Kobia. Uh, ambassador Roland, Roland Kobia is the EU um, ambassador to Azerbaijan, based in Baku. Uh, before that, he was the International Energy Relations Advisor to the EU Commissioner for Energy. He was notably in charge of the negotiations on the Southern Gas Corridor, and he's been working within the EU Commission for 20 years. Uh, ambassador Kobia. You thought I wasn't here. <laughs> it's always a worry when the guest doesn't turn up. So I think you're on the handheld mic. So the format we're going to um, employ today, we're going to ask each panellist to, to come up one by one. We'll ask a few questions. Once all the panellists are assembled, there'll be an opportunity for questions from the floor. So Ambassador Kobia, um, gas from the Caspian region remains obviously a high priority for the EU. Um, why does the EU see gas from the Caspian is being so important to its energy mix. Is this only a question of energy security or are there other reasons? Well, first, thank you for inviting me. And I, I've seen the list of speakers and as usual, the EU is put in a difficult position because I'm the only one who's not a native English speaker. So I, I hope that at least for the questions part, you will give me a bonus and the most difficult questions you will ask to my friends. Um, so, yes. Um, the, the, the Caspian um, region is indeed a very high priority for the EU. Um, this has been the case for a number of years. Um, it's very high on the political agenda and there are, there are very good reasons for that. We all know that the indigenous production of gas is decreasing in the EU. We know that the EU is dependent on a few suppliers, basically three main suppliers. We also knew, know that um, because of the indigenous production is going down, we are more and more dependent on, on imports. Now there have been, as you know, a few um, developments in the EU which will increase uh, that situation even more. And that's the uh, post-Fukushima syndrome uh, with the energy mix of a few um, member states of the European Union that will change and probably move towards more gas. Um, we have, I don't know if you have seen, we have just, the European Commission has just adopted a few uh, months ago, the um, 2050 roadmap, which actually shows that gas in the EU will be um, more and more important um, because of this change in energy mix, because of the decreasing uh, production in the EU. It also shows that renewable energies will actually be more important in our policies. So the question is, is that compatible? Is that coherent? Is that logical, you know, to call for more gas and to anticipate more gas demand while uh, we want to develop renewable energies? Well, the first thing is that um, we consider that gas and renewable energies are actually very complementary. Uh, one is baseload, the other one is not. And the more actually we will move towards renewable energies, the more we will need gas. Um, another aspect is that because of the crisis, we believe that maybe because of budget you know, constraints, because of the economic crisis, there will be less money in order to finance renewable energies. Um, and that may bring um, a situation where more gas is, is needed. And then there's also the call to gas strategy in the EU. So all, all these are the reasons why developing the gas corridor to the Caspian is, um, is so important. So as I said, it's very high on the political agenda. We have last year signed, I think, a landmark uh, agreement between President Aliyev in Azerbaijan, who will be the first country opening this gas corridor to the EU, and President Barroso of the European Commission, where they both uh, have actually agreed to open that corridor and to actually build um, a new dedicated pipeline that would be uh, from Baku, Azerbaijan, up to uh, European markets. I won't go into the details of this, of which pipelines will be chosen. This is uh, maybe for, for the questions. We have to leave some, uh, some meat on the bone. Um, just one or two points why um, it's all about EU's energy security. We believe in diversification. We believe that um, new entrants have the right to get into new markets, and this is the case of Azerbaijan, now just providing through swaps a little bit of gas to, to Greece. But Azerbaijan has uh, a lot of ambitions, and I think these ambitions are shared also by many other countries in the Caspian Basin. Um, in Central Asia, across the Caspian, but also in the Middle East. Um, look also what is happening in Eastern Mediterranean. 
uh, new discoveries in the Black Sea of the shore of Romania, also discoveries. So there are uh, many new entrants there who want to develop these markets and we want to open that corridor because we believe that it will actually, the opening of this corridor, the existence of this corridor will incentivize you know, more exploration and more gas coming on stream. What we want for this corridor, and this is, this is a very clear and constant EU position, is that we understand you know, the economic constraints, that um, the net back price for uh, suppliers will, be, will need to be good, but what we want is a pipeline that will be scalable. That means a pipeline that can evolve gradually as new gas comes uh, on stream, and that this pipeline is also a new dedicated pipeline that is not exist using the existing um, uh, gas uh, uh, networks. So uh, my final point, um, it's not only about consumers, it's, only about, it's also about sellers. We believe that energy security is important for us and the EU definitely needs you know, more gas in the future. But we believe that when you look at the word energy security, it's a beautiful concept because you can, you can use it as one concept, energy security, but you can also use it as two different words and using the terms energy, important for consumers, uh, but you can also look at the security aspect. And we believe that um, a, a number of suppliers, a number of new countries that want to come on the market are countries which live in difficult environments, in difficult regions. And getting a physical link, getting a long-term relationship with, with a stable and predictable market can actually increase their security in the sense that it can actually help their sovereignty and their independence. So this is a very important point for us as well because we believe these countries have the right to do business with all the countries they want to. Thank you very much. I think you've done a, a very good job of uh, describing uh, your goals and th these are the goals that are driving your support for Caspian gas getting to the European market. If we turn maybe just to talk a little bit about the role of the EU um, and I guess two aspects to this. Firstly, if you could maybe describe uh, how, how you see the EU's role in facilitating the Southern Gas Corridor, maybe touching on the, the Trans-Caspian Pipeline. And secondly, if you could explain why you think it's necessary for the EU to get involved at all. Why isn't this just left to um, the selling countries and the, the respective you know, commercial participants in both the, the selling countries and the markets? Well, why we believe it's important for the EU to be part of this uh, beautiful process of trying to build a Trans-Caspian pipeline uh, between Turkmenistan and Azerbaijan is, be is because we believe that we are part of it. Um, at the end of the day, if this pipeline is built, it means that a new western corridor will be opened between the two shores of the Caspian and will bring uh, Central Asian molecules to the European markets. Um, so just as a reminder for those of you who haven't followed this, this issue, which is, which is not uh, too, uh, too known, I think, to the public, um, the EU has actually received recently um, a mandate from the 27 energy ministers of the European Union in order to facilitate, in order to negotiate the, uh, uh, an international trilateral agreement between Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan and the EU on opening and building a Trans-Caspian pipeline be between Turkmenistan and Azerbaijan. This is the first time ever that the European Commission actually receives such a mandate from the member states in order to negotiate a new physical infrastructure outside the EU. So this is really a, a, an important moment. It, 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 it shows two things. It shows, one, the political importance that we attach to this, and I refer to the last bit of what I said in my previous question, and that is to consolidate these countries which have been independent for only 20 years, and we have to factor that in. We have to take this into account. Um, and the second one is the importance of getting access to the huge reserves of the Central uh, Asian countries, and notably Turkmenistan. I won't go into the figures because I believe that you, know, you can read all sorts of figures, but nevertheless, I mean, when you look at the Gaffney Klein um, study that has been uh, done some time ago, it's very obvious, without going into the details of the, of the figures, but that Turkmenistan is sitting on huge gas reserves. So the EU believes that um, we have an interest in accessing, of course, this gas, but that 
Turkmenistan also has an interest in opening a western corridor. <coughs> Today, Turkmenistan is selling north to Russia, is selling east to China, is selling south to Iran, and fine for us. We have, we have no problems with that. It's the entire right, and we respect that, from Turkmenistan to also expand you know, its, its selling basis, its, its customer mix. Um, but we believe that Turkmenistan has shown an interest in also developing um, a, a Western corridor to the EU. And this is something we as EU want to support, that we want to facilitate, and um, that we are, you know, we are engaged in this process to try to make proposals and put, you know, bring the, um, the momentum uh, forward. What we want to say here is that I've, I've read some articles, you know, in, in reviews and so on that um, the EU is actually willing to get all the gas from Turkmenistan. This is just, is just a nonsense because um, I, I read one figure recently saying that if the gas reserves of Turkmenistan were confirmed, um, and I'm not talking about only uh, South Yolotan, but also the, the, the other field, uh, Yashar, Minara, and so on, it would be 40 years of annual consumption of the EU. So it's basically too much for us. So we have no problem that you know, these countries continue to diversify their, 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 their sales to different countries. We are not requesting exclusivity, but we do not want to be excluded either. So we believe that Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan have expressed an interest, one as a seller, the other one as a transit country, to be part of this momentum. And uh, this is what we are trying to facilitate. Thank you. Okay, we might get some company on stage now. Um, we've got another panelist um, who also struggles with the English language. He's been your chair for most of the day, so I'm not going to introduce him further, but Laurent Rizekis will join us. And we're going to do a little dance where everyone moves down one. This, this really is Michael Parkinson, except we don't have the big song at the end. So. It's great to be back on the show. <laughs> Okay, so we've had uh, the ambassador there explaining why Europe um, is very interested in having Caspian gas um, come to the European market. And there's an obvious attraction for Turkmenistan as well. I mean, Europe's the, the largest market for gas in the world. However, in the other direction, you've got China, um, big demand for gas as well. Um, pipelines already constructed, very willing to, to build other pipelines at the drop of a hat. Who do you see as winning in, in what's developing to a bit of a tug of war over Turkmenistan's gas? Well, I, I think the, you know, I, I would say a bit more optimistically, it's probably not a tug of war just because, as Ambassador Kobe mentioned, there's so much gas in Turkmenistan. And with the, the, the field now called uh, Gara, Garashizlik, Garashizlik, the new name of Yolotan has been renamed, so it's called Garashizlik. It is, it, it is, it is, it is, it is really second or third largest gas field in the world. And I know there's been some commentary that, well, it's not confirmed, et cetera, but essentially it is. And so that, that field alone, never mind the rest of the res resources, can, can fill pipelines, you know, if, if you wanted to, I think in five directions, Europe, Iran, 20 BCM, Tapi to Pakistan and India, China, and then, and, and then Russia. So I don't think that the resource is, is a problem if, if, Turkmenistan can develop it. And that's a big question mark, and it's not obvious that the current course Turkmenistan has followed is gonna to lead to 150 BCM or whatever being produced, but the resource is there. Um, I think from Turkmenistan's point of view, Russia, the infrastructure is there, but the relationship you know, has, has broken down, and I, I don't necessarily see that changing. First of all, because Russia doesn't need it. Why, you know, as uh, mm -hmm. uh, Mark Jetve mentioned, why should Russia pay a negotiated price that was negotiated in 2008 that's pretty high uh, for gas it doesn't need it, it, it won't. So um, Iran is, is there, but it's, it's limited and there have been some problems with that relationship. Tapi is a difficult project uh, because Afghanistan lies between Turkmenistan and the markets. So it's really China. And I think even though there are currently three routes out of Turkmenistan, in essence, Turkmenistan has traded its reliance on Russia for reliance on selling to the Chinese, and that has implications for long-term price uh, leverage, uh, et cetera. So I think from the Turkmen point of view, strategically, it makes a lot of sense to work with companies, work with the EU, and try to build up uh, a, a route to, to the EU. So, okay, so just, just completing the picture in Turkmenistan before we broaden this back out again, uh, I mean, Chinese companies are the only 
foreign companies, uh, the only countries, um, sorry, the only companies uh, from foreign countries who are permitted <coughs> to invest in the upstream onshore Turkmenistan. Does that, uh, you know, make it more or less likely that gas from Turkmenistan is going to end up going east or west? west? Well, I, I, I don't think ch Chinese, I don't think CNPC has too much interest in selling gas in other directions. So, uh, you know, it's pretty, uh, other companies haven't been able to achieve PSA terms for onshore big gas in Turkmenistan. It's very helpful when you can come along and say, oh, and by the way, we're going to build you a $12 billion pipeline, and oh, and by the way, we're going to lend you $9 billion at a time when you desperately need money. You can't compete on that, so nobody can compete. Uh, we'll see if anything similar develops with, with India or with Indian uh, on the upstream side, but in any case, in terms of financial muscle and the ability for strategic reasons to put tens of billions on the table, it's only China, and so that's it. And uh, obviously for Turkmenistan to bring in other types of companies, they have to look at it in a different way because it won't come with $9 billion loan. Absolutely. Okay, we may just um, start to complete the panel here a little bit. Um, the next panelist is John Baldwin. Uh, John's currently the group political advisor to the BP group of companies. He's based in London. Uh, he's worked for, with BP for almost 30 years um, in various positions, and most recently as external affairs manager for Russia, Ukraine, and Kazakhstan. So welcome, John Baldwin. <coughs> Thank you. Cheers, John. Okay, so you're, you're sitting here as a representative of, of BP. Um, I, I think we should ask the question that the press are probably going to ask um, later on anyway, but this gives you a chance to, to get your piece in. Um, can you give us a brief update on Chardonnay's phase two and the selection of export routes and, and what the key factors are sure. influencing your choices? Well, I mean, I, I think, um, <coughs> I mean, we've, we've set out um, a set of criteria for the choices of uh, pipeline. Um, I mean, recently <coughs> we made a choice between uh, the TAP pipeline and ITGI, and actually uh, decided that TAP was the uh, a viable route uh, through to Italy. Uh, we've announced that actually uh, that uh, we also need to make a choice uh, between uh, the so-called West Nabucco and uh, SEEP um, uh, in Eastern Europe. And as people, I think, already know, uh, in Turkey we're looking uh, at both the option of uh, de-bottlenecking the existing BOTAR system and also a new, um, a new pipeline uh, through Turkey. Um, in the meantime, we've already committed <clears throat> around four billion to the progressing the upstream development. So I think the o overall message <clears throat> uh, is one of actually building momentum for the project. But I think it's important to understand that already this is uh, a very complex project, also uh, a very large project. I mean, if you add everything up uh, in terms of the upstream, the midstream, the downstream, I mean, you're talking in the region of about $40 billion. So it's already a very large project indeed. And I, I think it's important to remember because uh, ultimately all the money's got to come from the consumer one way or another. Um, and it has to be financed. And I think the, uh, uh, I always think of uh, these projects of actually having to stand on two stools. Both the political stool, because without the political will behind these sort of projects, as the ambassadors already described, you're unlikely to bring them to fruition, but they have to stand on a commercial stool as well. And both legs are essential. One leg alone doesn't work. Yeah, that, that gets me on to my... Does that cover it? It, it? it does, but it leads me on to my next question. <laughs> There's another one coming. Um, I mean, BP is a non-state player um, in a game, particularly in cross-border gas pipelines, that is very much a political game. I mean, they are by their nature political beasts. How do, as a company, and you're a political advisor to BP, how do you balance your shareholder needs, your, your commercial needs, versus the needs of you know, your producer country and the transit country in, in making these decisions? I mean, you've got 
Ambassador Cobia here saying that whatever pipeline option it is developed, they would like it to be scalable. Um, okay. is, does that come into your considerations? How do you do this balancing? Uh, well, yes. I mean, obviously, you have to, um, and you know, as we've set out, one of the criteria are the degree to which the projects actually fulfil the public policy requirements of the various countries involved. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's a difficult balancing act, uh, but you have to understand those requirements and be mindful of them. And actually also on the other side of it, talk to government and actually make sure they understand the commercial constraints. Um, because at the end of the day, it is in the interest of, um, if you like, all the interested parties to have something happen. Um, otherwise, um, you know, you run the risk of actually uh, uh, finding that it all takes longer than you would imagine. I mean, uh, there's the, quite a lot of very large projects around the world which actually never came to anything. Uh, and so I think you need to uh, build momentum uh, for the project, which we're doing. Actually, you know, $4 billion is actually a, a, a pretty um, uh, significant commitment by the uh, companies in terms of their commitment to the project to push it forward. Um, but we're not there yet. I mean, there's an awful lot that needs to be done. Uh, and I think people need to understand how difficult these projects are in terms of what it actually takes to get them done. Um, and, uh, and also understand the benefit. And, you know, there will be compromises that need to be made along the way. One, one last quick question before we complete our panel. Um, in terms of timing of, of making a decision on, you know, TANAP versus a uh, revitalized Botash system, etc. Is that end of this month? Is that what I hear in the media? Is that still accurate? Uh, I'm, I'm not actually sure what the decision, the timeline on um, on the uh, TANAP versus um, upgrading the Botash system is. Um, I, I don't actually know on that. We have already announced that we will be making a decision on SEEP and uh, West Nabucco. Mm -hmm. um, It'll be some time before we make um, a decision on as between West Nabucco and TAP, which is the other, the other key decision that needs to be made. But in any case, obviously, that decision needs to be made before we uh, progress to a final investment decision. So lots of decisions in a certain order, but no timetable. It's a, it's a big... Uh, well, there is a timetable, of course, but... Right. Um, but it's not, isn't it end of June for the decision that's been publicly stated? Is that still on? Yes, it is. Okay. Okay. We'll complete our panel and the last little shuffle along. We've got John Roberts. Um, John's an energy security specialist with Platts. Uh, most of you will, will know John from, from attending other conferences. Be very surprised if you've uh, been to a conference that John wasn't at. I'm sorry. He's a frequent commentator on global energy issues on uh, both television and radio. 40, 40. Acknowledged expert on Caspian and European pipelines. And his latest study, Pipeline Politics, the Caspian and Global Energy Security, is shortly due to be a bestseller uh, and will be published imminently by Platts and the UK's Royal Institute of International Affairs. Welcome, John. Thank you for so I, I remember um, in the late 90s I was involved in um, one of the earlier attempts to get a Trans-Caspian um, pipeline up and running. Um, when's that going to happen? Easy question to start you off. Short of a radical change of approach by the European Union, it won't happen before the Azerbaijan, before the Turkmen come to the conclusion that a line through Afghanistan is a no-go. And they're not going to reach that kind of a conclusion until after the withdrawal of American troops from Afghanistan or the end of combat role in 2014. <coughs> and then it will depend entirely on the security situation. And we have no idea what the security situation in Afghanistan will be then. But if it doesn't look terribly good then, at that point, finally, the penny might drop that Afghanistan is not a realistic option. As and when that they come to that conclusion, they would be sensible, and I think they would understand why looking to the West is a good idea, because it makes sense for them 
to have one export route that reaches an open market. Sales to Iran, sales to Russia, sales to China are all to closed markets. There's no market beyond the one that they sign their long-term contracts for. Reach Europe and you can reach open markets. The same also applies to a degree if they reach South Asia. Um, so my guess is not for some time. The radical possibility would be that is 10 BCM of stranded gas in the Caspian on the Turkmen side, that could be almost immediately put into an interconnector across the Caspian. Problem, the Azerbaijanis wouldn't mind that nearly as much as having a large volume because a large volume would compete with their own production. But the Turkmen's have exactly the opposite attitude. They want a large volume of exports across to Europe because essentially only a large volume makes it worth their while standing up to the Russians. And the bottom line, we haven't mentioned it at all in Transcaspian is, would Russia take any action to prevent Transcaspian? We don't know. A lot will depend on whether the EU actually has made it blindingly clear to the Russians that if they were to take any action against the Transcaspian, that would in effect be saying, you are using what one presume would be force to prevent a third country supplying Europe. If you were to use force in that kind of a manner, that would in effect be saying, you yourself are not a reliable partner in energy security because you rely on force to achieve your energy security aims, whereas we believe that we should achieve energy security through trade and commerce. So at the very start of that answer, um, you said, you know, barring a radical change in EU policy, we'd have to wait until um, Turkmenistan realised that TAPI is, is not going to happen. What, what's the change in EU policy that you think would make a difference now? What, what's, what's the EU doing wrong? If the EU could convince the Turkmen's that it really was well worth going for a quick fix to get some gas across the Caspian, you'd have to connect that in to a longer term commitment that the EU would be genuine in wishing to see that grow. There is a problem in this, which is basically the problem that derailed your efforts um, you know, 12 years ago to get a Trans-Caspian pipeline, which is namely any Turkmen gas has to transit Azerbaijan and Azerbaijan may be willing to allow a certain volume to go through, but the more Turkmen gas goes through, the greater the pricing pressure on Azerbaijan through competition on its own gas sales into Europe. So why would it wish to help a potential rival reach a market? Okay, so we've got two spare microphones sitting here. I see none of the other panellists have, have jumped for them yet, but I'd like to open that John's comments up if any of you have a Something you'd like to add to that? I'm thinking especially of Ambassador Copia. Now, as usual, I agree with everything John said, um, except um, the... No, I, I just have a question mark about the quick fix. Um, because we all know that the problem of the Transcaspian is not an energy problem. It's a political problem. Um, uh, Turkmenistan would be delighted, we believe, to sell its gas to uh, 500 million in uh, consumers' market, uh, which, as John said, would at least give them, you know, perspective of predictability, stability, transparency, um, and getting paid for what they sell. Um, so the issue is not that much to sell some gas; it's whether the quantities make it up for the political risk. And I don't have the answer, but I don't believe that Turkmenistan would probably be very interested in selling just a few BCMs and take that political risk just for a small quantity. They would take that risk because we, it's, it's of public knowledge that there are you know, some pressures. Uh, they would take it for a bigger quantity maybe. 
um, but maybe not for, for, for a small quantity. So I, I agree with the fact that maybe the psychological factor of opening the Transcaspian with smaller amount could trigger bigger amounts in the future, but because of the overall political context, I believe that the, it, it must be worth the risk. So who's actually, I mean, maybe just for the benefit of everyone here, uh, my understanding is that Turkmenistan um, are looking to sell their gas at, at their own border to the Caspian Sea. They, they want to sell it at that point. They don't want to be the end, you know, end seller into Europe themselves. Given that and given the fact that there aren't any Western companies involved in, in uh, onshore Turkmenistan, and given perhaps we've heard the reluctance of Azerbaijan to allow large volumes through at the same time they're marketing Chardonnays too, and there are other fines that made recently. Who's, who's actually going to build this thing? Who is going to own the Trans-Caspian pipeline? Does anyone have a view on, on who that's likely to be? I suppose I have to say Sorry. something. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, IHS Zero was commissioned by the World Bank European Commission and the European Investment Bank in 2009 to look into this question. The concept uh, developed by, uh, mainly by the European Commission was uh, something they called the CDC, the Caspian Development Corporation, which would bring together European buyers interested in buying Turkmen gas. And instead of buying that gas as would be normal in Europe, they would buy it at Turkmen's borders or Tur Turkmen coastline and then ship it all the way. Um, and that, that's still sort of the, the working uh, concept. Obviously, one can raise a lot of questions about how that would be done, the financial risks, uh, how you would backstop the financial risks that entity would be taking, uh, who their counterparty would be on the Turkmen side, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not, it's not easy, but uh, it, it's, the, it's a solution uh, that could work if, if a, a number of things fell into place. I think there's another big problem in that, which is that you're asking whatever it is, a Western company or a Western consortium or a European consortium, to put up an enormous amount of money for the midstream, which carries with it a very large amount of risk. Now, they are going to have to raise money on the markets for that. It might be doable, but I suspect it would only be doable if they had some kind of guaranteed access to the supply source. Now, the problem there is you're having to present the Turkmen's with the concept that you're saying you want a stake in the upstream and the Turkmen's don't want to give that. And if you're going to try to replicate the Chinese version in which the Chinese did manage to get an onshore PSA, you really are going to have to offer an entire integrated package. And it's very, very hard for all sorts of reasons, including European comp competition policy challenges, to put together one integrated package that includes construction, upstream stake, and a uh, diversified uh, and a united purchase and then diversified selling at market rates. I'm not saying it's impossible, I am saying it's difficult. The, the other obstacle surely is uh, if all that risk is being borne by the gas purchasers who then have the costs of, of transporting their gas all the way through to Europe, the price, which um, I'm assuming Turkmenistan probably have over inflated expectations of this European gas price they're going to get, the price at their border, if they're not taking any risk on the transportation, would presumably be disappointing. Is, is that a, is that a, um, a, a correct statement? Any views? Even more so, Dieter Helm's attitudes come true, and his, we do actually enter a position in which um, gas prices head south. Okay. So if, if maybe if we just put to one side the Trans-Caspian and, and, and move on to the western side of the Caspian Sea and maybe get into um, some of the areas that BP and John can talk a little bit more about as well. I mean, it's very clear that the Chardonnay's phase two volumes and likely other volumes of Azerbaijani gas will end up in the European markets. 
there's, there's a choice of route, etc. But it, the, these volumes will end up there. Um, there seems to be not a never-ending supply, but in, an increasing volume of gas in Azerbaijan, which would be enough to satisfy at least some of the diversification aims of the EU. Do we really need to worry about the gas on the other side of the Caspian? Do we need to worry about the Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan? Um, you know, wh why, why should we worry about Trans-Caspian when there's all this gas in Azerbaijan that's more readily accessible? Well, I mean, my view is, you know, a pretty agricultural one. I'd, I'd be quite happy when we got 16 BSCMA from Chardonnays into Turkey and Europe. Uh, that'll do to begin with. Uh, and then we can worry about some of these other issues, I think, later. And I, I mean, I think it is also worth thinking more widely, perhaps, than just um, Central Asia. I mean, Central Asia clearly will be important for the long term. But, you know, it's worth thinking about gas prices at Henry Hub. <clears throat> and uh, when will the US start becoming a gas exporter? I mean, Europe in many ways has already benefited significantly from the fact that a lot of LNG that was destined for the US is now actually coming to Europe. Um, and I mean, I, I think it is actually worth thinking about some of the impact of the shale gas uh, revolution in the US. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure of my facts here, but I'm pretty sure that US gas prices are about the same today as they were 20, 20 years ago. I mean, it, it's quite a remarkable fact. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure personally how this is all going to pan out, but, um, you know, this is a huge impact that it's worth thinking about. The, the, the other uh, thing worth mentioning, the other source of supply, I thought you were actually going to say this, is, is potentially Iraq. Now, and as you know, two of the Nabucco partners have a small share in an upstream project in the Kurdish regional government, a part of Iraq. Um, and for political reasons, that's not ready to go right now. So it hasn't been able to feature in, except as theoretical future source of gas into the current southern corridor discussions. But by all accounts, this is uh, pr pretty cheap gas when you take the liquid that will be produced into account. Um, and it's geographically not, you know, not that far away. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that's something to watch and, and, and strategically that over time could end up having a big, a big impact on this story. So, so that would suggest, Laura, that there's even less need to think about the Trans-Caspian, that there's even more gas available on this side of the sea. I wouldn't say that. I think one of the things is what kind of a how do the Turkmens themselves think? Do they think that they have such a gigantic resource, and they do indeed have the world's biggest onshore gas field, that the world will be to part of their door? Or do they find that because gas is so diversified and so relatively plentiful everywhere else, that even though they have the world's biggest gas field, it gets developed slower than expected. It gets developed for markets that are specifically prepared to take the, to do the effort into developing a highly complex field, which probably will wind up being, therefore, pretty much just CNPC, the Chinese. Or do they actually start becoming a part of the global economy? And I don't think we know the answer to that. At the moment, they still seem to be locked in a rather, we would say, old-fashioned mentality. If they come out of it, if they start really engaging to the world, and there are one or two signs of the, the thinking like this, then that would change very, very strikingly, because then they would be the driver for Transcaspian. And the point is, at the moment, I think much more of the drive for a Trans-Caspian is coming from the consumer side than is coming from the producer side. Um, and we, would, you know, we really need to see that change if it's going to happen. Maybe another aspect why you know, getting this gas from Central Asia would still be um, uh, useful is 
Well, it's true, Azerbaijan is exploring more fields and there are very good, you know, um, yeah, prospects and some gas has been confirmed already. Um, ACGD, Babsharan, um, possibly Umit and Babek. I mean, there's plenty of gas out there. Quantity is a question mark, to be frank, but uh, there's clearly some gas. Um, but on the other hand, we don't know, there's also a big question mark on the Turkish gas market. The Turks will probably have uh, an increasing demand uh, internally, um, and that will swallow possibly part of the Azeri gas that will transit into Turkey. Um, so uh, gas coming from the other side of the, of, the, of the Caspian would certainly be useful. And another aspect which is, um, which is uh, of course I'm not working in an oil and gas company, so it's very easy for me to say that, um, but um, we would like to see more gas-to-gas -gas competition uh, on the European market. Um, prices are extremely high. Um, we talk about a crisis. Yes, well, you have a lot of companies that, you know, pay uh, energy uh, intensive or gas intensive companies, uh, BASF, AXO, just, you know, these kinds of companies paying extremely high amounts, uh, extremely high prices for the gas, uh, competing with American firms, which, as it has just been mentioned, uh, have, you know, access to very cheap gas now. Um, on the average of, you know, around $3 MMBTU compared to uh, EU where it's uh, between 10 and $14, uh, not to count in Euro. Um, so, um, Casp uh, uh, Central Asian gas would actually be welcome in order to generate a bit more competition on the European market and, and try to uh, uh, maybe bring the market into um, a situation where the spot prices could be, uh, could be uh, you know, factor in. In, in a more um, pervasive way um, and where the, um, the, the, the companies would actually, you know, not be tied by long-term contracts uh, and extremely expensive gas, but where, you know, uh, contracts could be renegotiated and have a look at what's happened in Turkey recently. Okay, we'll throw the open now to uh, the audience and maybe see whether there are some questions there before we... On the front here, there's a microphone just coming. Thank you. I'm Oleg Vukmanovic from Reuters. I just wanted to ask a quest two questions, if I may, quick ones to um, BP and the ambassador. Um, the first one is, uh, in terms of uh, pricing structure, like you were just saying, would you prefer to see um, the price of gas from the Caspian uh, related to hub prices? It seems to, what you, to be what you were saying, instead of some kind of inflexible oil-linked long-term contract. Uh, and the second question is, it seems that um, from the timetables that y the, the final winner of the um, Southern Corridor will be picked after Gazprom decides on FID for South Stream. Are they at all connected? Well, on, on, on the pricing, it's not for me to decide. Um, of course, what we would like to see is the cheapest gas, whether it's a long-term contract or a spot, uh, you know, on the, or the spot, uh, the, the spot markets. Um, I would be I would be accused to be a bit too interventionist if I was expressing myself on what would be the best uh, the best situation. Uh, what we see, nevertheless, is I think, and what we will see more and more, is a paradigm paradigm shift in terms of, of prices on the gas market. It's, more, it's very likely that the gas will be less and less linked to the oil index and will be more and more linked to the spot, uh, to the spot markets. Um, I, I, I recently heard a figure, but what, for what it's worth, that 42% uh, of, of, of European gas is already delinked from the oil index, which is, which is quite an amazing figure. Uh, to be, to be, of course, you know, confirmed, and but I think I think it gives it gives a trend. And your second question it was on South Stream, but I didn't get it very well. Sure, yeah, it was just um, Gazprom said it was going to make FID on South Stream by the end of this year, and the winner for uh, which pipeline route will deliver gas from the southern through the southern gas corridor will take place after that, so early next year. Um, so are you waiting to see what Gazprom decides before 
Is, is, is South Stream still a foil for Southern Corridor, and to what extent is that true? So this was a question for John, was it? Or? For, for John and, and yourself. Well, I'll, I'll leave John, but happiness is multiple pipelines. Huh? If Gazprom wants to build South Stream, fine. I mean, we, we have nothing against it. We are not, uh, the EU has never expressed any, any feeling against South Stream. We just believe that the Southern Corridor is, is, is opening a new route, just like South Stream is, but it's also delivering new gas. It's not diverted gas. Uh, so we prefer, you know, um, projects that uh, spend the money in trying to find new molecules instead of diverted molecules. So, but if Gazprom has, you know, tens of billions to spend on, 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 on South Stream, I mean, fine. At the end of the day, the beauty of this game is that all these pipelines go to European markets. <laughs> If, if I, I think where, where South Stream would be bad for marketing Azerbaijani gas is if somehow this FID at the end of the year was to disrupt somehow Azerbaijani plans to market gas. It's just not, not going to happen. I mean, they, since they're selling gas through South Stream in theory into markets Gazprom already supplies, unlike Sokar and VP and their partners in Azerbaijan, they don't need to have a bunch of new gas sales agreements negotiated. Um, they can build it without that because, if necessary, they can supply gas to existing markets through the pipeline. So, so w the idea that uh, the Shakhtanese partners have fully termed agreements with a number of buyers across, uh, across Europe, depending on choice of routes, whatever, the idea that some of those players will then not sign their agreements to get this diverse supply of gas because of something related to South Stream, I think is just not, not credible and not something to be concerned about. Yeah, I, I mean, I think all I'd, I'd add to what's already been said is, I mean, you know, it's a market. The, the way the gas uh, price will get set is a negotiation between the buyers and sellers. Um, one isn't in a position to anticipate where that will end up. Uh, and the second point is, uh, again, on the competition between the pipelines, it's a competition. I think time frames are fascinating. It was in January that Southstream said it would take a final investment decision by the end of the year, which is a remarkable short time because they said that in the process, <coughs> what they actually said was in January, one, we will do the environmental impact assessment, two, we will do the front end engineering and design, and three, we will start construction before the end of the year. Normally you wait until you've got the front end engineering design completed, before you start thinking about when you're going to do the construction. But be that as it may, that timetable was set, in a sense, independently. It certainly isn't. It may be designed to be a response to a Southern Corridor timetable by BP and the Chateaunese Consortium. But it, it BP in that way and its colleagues are not connected to the South Street one. This is a Russian concept. But I think actually we may be actually making the wrong comparison. If there's a connection, is the connection not so much with what Shakhtar is happening, but with what might be happening in Ukraine? This is going to come very shortly after the Ukrainian parliamentary election. Is this a decision that by saying we are going to take it very quickly after you've held your elections, giving the Ukrainians one last chance at securing, at uh, sorry, concluding the kind of transit agreement for Russian gas continuing, but very much concluding an agreement on the kind of terms that Gazprom would like rather than the kind of terms that Ukraine would hope it might get. I think there's far more likely to be a connection that way around than a direct connection with, with the whole Shakhtanese timetable. Okay, any, any other questions from the, from the audience? Okay, maybe just one more from me, and then I think we're, um, I'll hand back to Laurent then, but I think we're heading for a coffee break That's shortly right. thereafter. Um, just, I guess, last question. Current financial upheaval um, throughout Europe, etc. I mean, I know that gas projects are long-run things, so that won't affect parties' view of whether the project's worth doing. But it may affect a party's ability to raise finance in this market. 
Is that a factor in any of these different routes and, and the considerations of the parties, you think, as to where they go? I mean, China, obviously, pipeline built, not very difficult for the Chinese to, uh, to fund expansions of that in the current market. They, they do have money. European banks, not much project finance money there at the moment. Well, I mean, BP finances things primarily balance sheet financing, so it's a very different um, very different proposition. Um, so, uh, I mean, clearly, I mean, I think some of the financial difficulties um, can potentially have an impact, but, you know, as I said, I mean, uh, what we're aiming to do is to uh, continue building the momentum for the project. I think that one of the criteria that the BP and their partners laid down was financeability, and I think I, I don't think it would be stated by, by you guys, but clearly that's what killed off ITGI. Um, TAP, in contrast, has very strong, with Stad Oil, with Jan Rugas, and then the, the Swiss company that's owned by some of the wealthier cantons mm -hmm. of Switzerland. So that's in a very strong financial position. No, it's true that the crisis doesn't make things easier. Um, but on the other hand, and without willing to take a position between Merkel and and Mr. Hollande, um, I think precisely you, you need money to generate growth now. Um, and the EU has made a proposal a few months ago in the uh, Connecting Europe facility to uh, precisely you know, bring up more infrastructure uh, in the EU and has proposed nine billion. So the money is difficult to get, but the money can be uh, available if uh, one wants to, to do the necessary investment precisely to try to tackle the crisis. Interesting. Of the four pipelines that are still more or less one way or another up for consideration, TANAP would largely be funded by the Shastinese partners, primarily SOCAR. Um, TAP, Lawrence made the point, uh, a shareholder finance is, 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 is fine. Same would go for C. Question mark over West Nabucco, whether the transit countries, the, 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 the gas companies of the transit countries could come up with money. They might be the ones that had the toughest task, but remember one thing. <coughs> the Shastinis partners take two decisions simultaneously. One is the final pipeline choice. The other is the markets that they sell into and the contracts that they're selling into. So if, the, if there are contracts to sell gas into the markets that as it were, would be a, a, a served by Nabucco West, then I think Nabucco West would still have, be able to raise the money. So I, I don't really think there's an issue on the financing. Um, I'll be, I'll one be way or another, all of, them, uh, all of them, I think, under current circumstances, probably could raise the money. I would be surprised, though, if TANAP went ahead without a project financing, giving Botash's involvement in some of the Chardonnay's partners, but anyway. So I think, uh, unless there are any other questions, we'll um, bring this session to a close and I'll allow Laurent back to his role and he can uh, ring the bell for afternoon tea.